Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh God, my Redeemer. Amen. Today's encounter with a miracle of Jesus is a story I've taught many times. In my humble opinion, it's one of Jesus' finest moments. To me, one of the tests of a truly great story, and I love stories, is as you're telling it, uh, uh, or if somebody else is telling it, you're sitting there the whole time thinking, oh, I wish I could have been there. Have you ever heard a story like that the whole time? It was like, oh, I would have loved to have witnessed that, you know, up close and personal. To have been there when the rules of nature were turned upside down. Give me a ringside seat for that, baby. The other test of a great story is when you start to especially identify with one of the characters in the story. Maybe it's his impossible circumstance or her very sad struggle. You find their stories deeply moving, maybe even compelling. Great stories do that. They make you want to be there, and they also make you wonder, who am I in this story? Well, Mark is our storyteller today, so I want you to grab your Bibles, digital or paper, and locate Mark chapter 2. In Mark 2, it's still very early in Jesus' ministry. Although he has done some miracles, healed a few people, given a handful of speeches, and sure enough, the people are bringing other people, lots of people. Momentum is clearly building, perhaps building a bit too much. And I say that because Jesus has just healed a man of leprosy, but then he told him not to tell anybody. I'll show you why in a bit. But Jesus' popularity was getting so out of hand, he could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside town in lonely places. But the people still came to him anyway. So Jesus wisely took a break. He just went dark for a bit. But then, a few days after that, Jesus, when he again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. He's back! Our hometown hero, the healer of every disease, the one who has just cast out an unclean spirit. He's here. He's back in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a tiny little poduck kind of village. It was also Peter's hometown. It's where he grew up, where his mom still lived. And like most country boys, Peter had grown up hunting and fishing and driving pickups uh, until this very unconventional rabbi came to town and he called Peter to be one of his disciples and Peter's life would never again be the same. But now Jesus' road show is back in Capernaum. And I want you to picture this because when word gets out that Jesus is back in town, even though it's a tiny little just grease spot, people from everywhere, perhaps by the hundreds, maybe thousands, they camped on Peter's doorstep, and they weren't all fans. Some in the crowd that day had come because they were intent on investigating Jesus. Far from seekers, these guys were skeptics, a bunch of religious insiders who had appointed themselves as truth detectives come to see if the rumors they had heard about this miracle worker were true. Why did they come now? Because Jesus has just healed that leper I just told you about. You see, that was a miracle uh, that just didn't happen. There is no record of a leper being healed, not from the time of the Mosaic Law when it was brought down uh, by the finger of God to Moses on Sinai, not from then until this very moment. But this Jesus character, the rumor has it, he just did what everybody knows can't be done. 
The ancient rabbis had taught for generations that there were three messianic miracles. And these three miracles were to serve as signs that God's people could look for and know that Messiah was among us. And one of those three messianic miracles the, the rabbis taught was that Messiah would heal a leper. So Jesus heals a leper, and word spreads through Galilee like wildfire. But see this uneducated rabbi who just a few months before was a lowly carpenter in no good Nazareth, well, it just didn't add up for people. So these hoity-toity religious muckety-mucks came to investigate. And I want you to picture it. This mass of people, some seekers, some skeptics, they are all jam-packed in Peter's mama's house. Now, the architecture in Capernaum was almost universal throughout the town. Nearly every home was a simple two-story box-shaped construction. The first floor was the living quarters, and the second floor was an open space typically reserved for larger gatherings. It was in a similar upper room where Jesus shared his last supper with his men and where the disciples prayed as they awaited the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now the roof portion was flat and it was often used as a place to sleep on hot desert nights. So most homes not only had an outside stairway leading to the second floor, often it would go all the way to the roof. Let's talk roofing material. It was made from tree saplings, mortared together with a mixture of sand and tar, and then these large clay tiles would be laid into place. I give you all that background because Jesus was teaching in that very floor plan on the second floor in the upper room, and that place was packed. People everywhere a whole lot of sick and broken people, and many of them were spiritually seeking people. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. Just picture, it's so crowded that some strained to sneak a peek through the windows, others jammed that staircase, if only to catch just a few words from this dynamic speaker, or even better, to witness one of his breathtaking miracles. Just don't forget, there were also judgmental people there. Remnants from the days when the law ruled with an iron fist. These men were the self-appointed arbiters of the law. They weren't sitting there hoping for a truth bomb from heaven. They weren't hoping to receive a healing. They were looking for dirt. And it didn't take long. Some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. They tried to take him into the house but the way Luke tells this story, they couldn't find a way to do this because of such a large crowd. So what'd they do? Did they do what we do and turn around and go home? No. They made the incredible, faith-filled, and courageous decision to do whatever it would take to get their friend before Jesus. Just imagine Jesus is still preaching his sermon, and it's a good one, when all of a sudden there's this crunching, scraping sound that disrupts everything, kind of like a bat, I suppose. <laughs> and then, then pieces of tar and, and mud, they, they stop dropping on people's heads and in perfect unison the whole room looks up just as the crack begins to form and then one hand a human hand reaches through the crack and rips away more tile and and and, and then another uh tile and and then another and and as the hole gets larger and larger more hands appear eight of them in fact 
plus eight arms and eight legs, all busy as beavers pulling back tiles until that hole was big enough for a grown man to pass through. A fact you've got to know deeply troubled the homeowners. Suppose we can turn this into insurance as an act of God, Jesus being here and all. But yucks aside, why would anybody want to destroy a perfectly decent roof? That's what the people in the house wanted to know. So they're watching intently as these four men begin lowering a mat and lying on that mat was a fifth man, the same man that everybody knew well in town as the guy who laid at the entrance to the synagogue begging for bread, maybe a few coins. But now he's been lowered and he's lying at the feet of Jesus. You know what stinks about this story? We don't know his name. His only descriptive was a paralytic. Now, we could only imagine the plight of a paralyzed person back in this day. It had to feel like a death sentence, no wheelchairs, no government assistance. And unless you had a crew of very faithful friends that you could depend on for literally every need in your life, you didn't have a ghost of a chance. Thankfully, this guy on a mat with no name, what he did have was a crew of ride-or-die friends who weren't going to give up just because they couldn't get in through the front door. I suppose we know one other thing about him. He had a mat. Well, actually, he needed a mat. Even with four friends, he needed a mat. Can you imagine to be known only by your weakness? You, you realize we all have at least one, right? Most of us more than one. But every single person in this room, we all need a mat. Last week, Pastor Josh called them bricks. And many of us wrote our weakness, our sin, on a brick. So... Matt, brick, same deal. Both are symbols of our weakness, our brokenness, our, our imperfections, whatever it is that has imprisoned us. It's the story of me that I really would prefer to hide from you. It's the as-is clause that we have to visit in every relational contract we make. This is what's not normal about me. That's the conversation nobody wants to have because it feels risky when you have a mat and nobody knows. And, and, and that sometimes, uh, even though you have a mat, somebody else has to help you carry the mat. But, but when they do get close enough to know these things, other people tend to see your real underbelly, and they become acquainted with your most shameful weaknesses, which means that kind of transparency brings a risk, doesn't it? Because if they choose, they might just drop you and walk out on you. And, and when they do drop you, as people sometimes will, that hurts. That hurts bad. Maybe your mat is a temper you can't seem to control. There's a lot of that on this wall. You lash out at the people you love the most. You spew out hot words you know you will regret, but they come hot and fast anyway. Or maybe your mat is a fear that you just can't shake or, or the chronic inability to, to trust. There it is several times. Trust anybody. Maybe you always need to be in control. That's there as well. Or maybe you're addicted to something you know is destructive, but you just keep doing it anyway. Maybe it's an awful secret about things that you used to do, but the scar that those things cause still holds you captive. Just let it be understood. We all have mats. 
And we've all spent the better part of our lives trying to manage that stupid mat. Am I right? Maybe you manage your mat by pretending you don't have a mat because you're strong and healthy and good. And it's a ruse. Everybody knows it's a ruse. But as long as you play the role, maybe people will think that you're something more than what you know yourself to be. But if you think you feel in prison, this man, his whole life was confined to a three-by-six pallet. Somebody else likely had to feed him. He slept on the same piece of cloth he laid on all through the day. And if nobody was around to help him, he would urinate in the same spot where he ate. But somehow to his credit, and to his friend's credit, somehow he had built a community of safety. A band of four brothers who had grown to love him so much they were willing to step into possible social disaster just to help their friend. They didn't care what anybody thought or how silly they might appear because their friend needed to get before Jesus. So they brought him. I wonder, do you have a friend who would carry a corner of your mat? Yeah. Listen, that kind of relationship doesn't just happen. You got to make it happen. I like what Yogi Berra said. He said, if you don't go to somebody's funeral, they won't go to yours. <laughs> There's truth there somewhere. So when these four friends hear that Jesus is back in town, they run to their buddy's house. They pick him up, literally. Evidently, at least one of them had already seen Jesus heal somebody, maybe even that leper. And when he witnessed that amazing miracle, he thought of his friend, and so he ran. He ran to his buddy with rescue on his mind. Now, we don't know how the man on the mat felt about this impromptu field trip. For all we know, he had gotten his hopes up so many times before and it never worked out. Maybe he was weary of even trying. Anybody? Maybe he didn't want to be disappointed. Not, not again. Besides, his friends had already done so much for him. And the idea of them lugging him across town to see the miracle worker, that's just too much, guys. You've already done too much. But see, the only part that was way too much was the judgment that poor man had to face. You see, in that culture, if you were paralyzed, people just knew there was something wrong with you. God was angry at you because either you did something bad or maybe your parents did something bad, so bad it caused God to make this, this horrible thing happen to you. So going out in public was about the last thing you'd want to do, right? But they didn't care. Dude, we're going. Got it. And they each grabbed a corner and bugged out. Trouble is, by the time they got to where Jesus was, the place was packed. And nobody seemed interested in helping them find a spot so they could get their obviously friend in need before Jesus. Find your own way. That's what we had to do. We got here early. It's not like they didn't try. In fact, Luke says they tried really hard. But the doors were shut, the windows were closed, the crowd was lined all the way up that staircase and even spilling out into the streets. There is no way they could not find a way. So they start brainstorming, which is always dangerous when five dudes start brainstorming, especially five dudes from the boonies, okay? Speaking as one who hails from West Virginia, this stunt is something only a bunch of hillbillies would do. I know, let's dig a hole in the roof and then we can lower Junior all the way down on a rope. All in favor? Kind of a weird way to meet Jesus, but these guys are so devoted to their friend, they're not going to let some stupid detail like a rope get in their way. So they... Uh, or a roof getting away, so they grab a rope 
and head upstairs. And this is where I begin to imagine me as a part of this story. Because these guys are the ones in this story I aspire to be like. I want to be one of this man's hillbilly buddies, willing to tear through a roof if it means leading my buddy to Jesus. I mean, whatever it takes, right? And so as I thought about that, I started brainstorming too. Hmm. Hmm. And I landed on a website that generates names for wannabe rednecks. Just, just type in your boring name plus a little bit of sidebar info and out pops your hillbilly handle. So I thought, okay, uh, who do I want to carry my four corners? Well, of course, I'd want my son. So I put Josh's name in and, and seriously, out came Billy Bob Pig Pusher. <laughs> and Andrea, too, right? So uh, she's got to be on the team, and her hillbilly name is Trixie Bell Houston. <laughs> and I thought about Eli. I thought, you know, let's go with Eli, who will hereafter and forever be known as Buford Jackson. Maybe you want to know my hillbilly name. Believe it or not, it's true. First time I typed my name in, it came back Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried again. Call me Cletus Hatfield. But I'd be happy to go up on a roof with that crowd, willing to do whatever it takes, not worried about etiquette. The only thing that matters is getting more friends in front of Jesus. The only problem is that was a nice roof. Unlike most roofs in that day, this one was made by, from tiles, which, which required a lot of digging, and they didn't bring any tools for digging. So here's the question every believer must wrestle with. What do you do when the way gets hard? And no matter how you try, you just can't find a way. And yet you know that you've been given this sacred assignment, or maybe you've been given a second chance, or maybe it's a call from God to, to walk in something different, something better, to be a person of impact. You know you've been called to this mission, and yet you knock on the door, and nobody answers you check the windows, and they're all blocked. Yeah, you could say, well, I tried. But then every time you see your friend strapped to that mat, you're going to wonder, if only I had tried harder. So to your credit, you just lower your head and you do it. No, this wasn't well planned at all. And people for the rest of time are going to call what they did foolish, impractical, downright wasteful and disruptive this whole service that some worship team had meticulously planned it's going to be a disaster and it's all his fault besides there's no guarantee it's going to work I mean what if it doesn't work what if Jesus gets angry because because he's he's down there you know just teaching his heart out and everybody's listening intensely it's getting real good and all of a sudden dirt and sticks and pieces of tile start falling on everybody's heads. Jesus is doing important stuff down there and yet we're going to interrupt what's happening with a whole household full of people just so one person can get help. I don't know that kind of feels wrong but they decided to go ahead and wreck the roof anyway to just do whatever needed done to get their friend before Jesus yeah maybe it'll be expensive yeah some will call it impractical and the truth is we are just making it up as we go but hey let's go that mindset it makes the the, the, the typical religious type downright nervous have you noticed even now it's really quiet in here you're nervous but you know what 
we need to go ahead and wreck the roof anyway. Because our one assignment, there is no doubt, is to get more and more of our friends before Jesus. Man, I love these guys because they understood the urgency. They understood well this assignment that we have all been given. Someday soon, our Savior Jesus is going to make a return visit. And I happen to believe that the date for his arrival is far sooner than most of us even realize. So soon, we don't have time to sit around dilly-dallying. What we need to do is yank up tiles. And if you have to, grab a corner of somebody's mat, anybody's mat, and just take them to Jesus. If there's anybody in this story I want to be like, it's those four guys. But can I be painfully transparent with you? All of my life, I have imagined myself as one of the heroes, right? one of the four dudes, one of those creative, entrepreneurial hero types. Just show me a problem and I'll show you my solution. Or step aside and I'm going to take in a corner, maybe two. And never until now (laughs) have I thought much at all about the guy on the mat. But now I do. I, I I wonder how he must have felt. The Bible doesn't say he was just kind of there. For all I know, his friends just talked him into this stunt. Or maybe they just did it without permission. Whatever. He was totally dependent on their love for him. We are close enough now to my transplant surgery that I want to be really transparent with you. I had decided early in this journey that my days of ministry must be over. God had called me to be a pastor when I was just nine years old, a calling that rested so powerfully on me even as a teenager. My focus was clear and my passions burned hot. And that fire has never died down, not even once for what is now almost 50 years. But when my kidneys tanked over three years ago, and and then when they just died all together last summer, I really did. I thought, is this the end? Maybe not the end of my life, which that would be great gain, by the way. That'd be really cool. But certainly the end of God's great purpose for me being here which to me is a far greater tragedy. Who am I if I'm not a pastor? I've said it for years. Preaching is why I breathe. God gave me breath for this holy purpose. So what is my life if I'm hooked to a dialysis machine or stuck to some stupid mad? But then God has come along and he wrecked the roof. He miraculously brought a donor into my life. Her name is Sherry. And from the moment, yeah. And from the moment Sherry heard my need, she knew that God was calling her. And she told me, Pastor, I'm not going to let you not get back in the game again. I'm not going to let this need go unmet. I'm going to do whatever it takes so that your body is whole again. And so there she is. I mean, she's holding tight to my mat. Okay, maybe she didn't tear up a roof, but she did willing, She is willing to let her body get cut and an organ removed. I can't fathom that. Can you? She and her family moved to Mississippi several months ago, and I thought, well, that's it. But she didn't not even once move away from her calling. She believes that God has called her to this. And she's going to be obedient to what he has told her she must do. And so here we are, 10 days away. (laughs) And and, and I'll be honest, the the, the aftermath of the surgery is what bothers me because I don't like being carried. But at least now I do kind of understand. 
I wonder what he was thinking as he was being lowered. Is Jesus going to be ticked because I ruined his sermon? And is he really able to heal me, a cripple? And, and what about all these people? What if they start throwing tile at me? Or what if my friends lose their courage and their grip and they drop me? Trust me, all of that and more is racing through his brain until he softly lands at Jesus' feet and time stopped. The whole room paused. It's your move, Jesus. Look at verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, Check that out. Nobody had said anything. So it's not that Jesus heard something and it moved him. It's what he saw. What did he see? I mean, besides that big hole in the ceiling, four dusty faces peeking through, sweaty and anxious faces thinking only of their friend and believing that somehow maybe Jesus will have the same kind of heart that the prophet said he would have. You mean besides that? Well, Jesus searches their faces, and what he sees is faith. And because he saw what he saw, Jesus speaks. What does he say? Is he going to say what we hope he's going to say? Before I tell you, there's other people in this story that you also might identify with. We've got the friends holding the mat, and we got the guy stuck to the mat, but what about the crowd? Have you ever wondered about the people in the crowd? These are the ones who got there early <laughs> and they had their seat in the house, same seat they always sit in. And now they're sitting there facing the teacher with their backs turned away from anything going on outside the house. Picture them, got their Bibles open, taking notes, listening intently. And so when somebody outside the house tries to get inside the house and when they start making noise and creating such a distraction, those early birds get perturbed because those people outside the house shouldn't got here early if they wanted to be in the house. That's the mindset of the crowd. When my experience inside God's house is prioritized over the needs of those outside God's house. When I care more about my needs than I care about restoring the lives of those who are still living quiet lives of desperation, whose lives are shattered and broken, but hey, I'm okay because I'm in. If that's your mindset, you're part of the crowd. When the church exists only for herself, when the church turns her back on those not yet in, what we are saying to those on the outside is to hell with you. Literally. But we do. We sit in our holy huddles. And lately, you know what everybody wants to talk about? The end time. Oh, man, we're all about the signs of the times. Hot topic for insiders, and for good reason. The signs, they really are gathering, aren't they? And not just gathering, they're accelerating. Given a global pandemic breaking out on what feels like unprecedented levels, plus governmental overreach to the point of actually shutting down churches, then there's Russia invading Eastern Europe, and perhaps worse, and the possibility of those dominoes tipping in such a way that China will begin to make a land grab of her own. All of these things, folks, they are spoken of in Scripture. And then when you add in the, the great social chaos, what Paul described as terrible times and what Jesus said would be an increase of wickedness, and then you turn on the Grammys and they're celebrating Satan, and you hear the president predicting food shortages plus whispers of a new world order and a godlessness on such a grand scale it would make Sodom and Gomorrah blush course we want to speak about these things. Why wouldn't we want to discuss these things? 
I want to be clear. I believe that the time is at hand. I do. But, but if it is, I find no place in Scripture where those of us who are already on the inside are commanded to spend whatever time remains trying to unravel all of the mystery of the end times. No! What we are commanded to do is whatever it takes to see that those still out the side the house can come inside. The whole point of the signs is that those of us on the inside might redouble our efforts and leverage the full force of our passions to wreck the roof if need be so that one more person could get to Jesus. That's all Jesus had on his mind. To him, the only other person in that room was that man on the mat. And so he stoops down right beside him, takes the man's hand and tenderly said, Son, your sins are forgiven. His buddies are still peeking through the hole they'd made. What do you say? Tell Jesus he's paralyzed. Couldn't have been a bigger train wreck because everybody knew. His friends knew. He knew. Even the crowd knew. Everybody knew except, I guess, Jesus. I'm surprised somebody doesn't just say, Hey, Jesus! He's got a way more immediate problem here than his sin. And Jesus would have replied, no. No, he really doesn't. Son, your sin is the main problem of your life. I understand you can't walk. And I know that fact has caused you untold suffering. And I'm going to get to that, I promise. But you need to realize that the main problem in every person's life and the main problem in your life, it isn't your suffering. It's your sin. Are you with me? Your pressing need is not your primary need. And, and what you want most isn't what you need most. And yes, it may feel urgent, but it's not the most important problem you're facing. Your most important fundamental problem in life is that you are alienated from God. There's a barrier between you and your maker, and it's got to get removed. You got to have a do-over. Son, your sins are forgiven. And with those five words, Jesus performed the far greater miracle in this story or of any story, greater than cleansing lepers, greater than raising the dead, greater even by far than casting out demons. This man had lived his whole life choked by sin and not just his own sin, He'd been told his whole life that his condition wasn't just his fault, but it was his fault. And so you deserve to flounder on that mat. And no doubt over the course of time, he came to believe every word of that. And yet Jesus, in a powerful demonstration of what his coming kingdom would be all about, with just five simple words, he set that man's spirit free. Oh, that beautiful word, forgiven. Did you know it hints at the idea of sending it far away? Son, all of your sins, I, I'm, I'm sending them far, far away. All of them. That's the thought. Same idea David had in mind when he said that God takes our sins and removes them as far as the east is from the west. And if you think about that, that's about as far as it can get. If you head east and keep going east, you never get to west, right? It's what Micah believed when he said that God will take our sin and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. That's pretty far away too. Isaiah said the same thing. He said, God will sweep away our offenses like a cloud. And Jeremiah, he said that God will banish our sins from his mind and that he will remember them no more. 
Now, maybe you still think that Jesus saying such a thing to a poor guy lying on a mat, that I don't know, that's kind of odd. After all, he didn't get dragged up those steps and then dropped through a hole in the roof just to have Jesus remind him that he was a dirty, rotten sinner. Trust me, he already knew that. But if that's what you think Jesus was saying, my friend, you still don't understand the gospel. Because this was not a reminder. This was a removal. As Jesus, in tender compassion, reached down into this man's deepest parts and healed him of a far greater need than just his paralysis. Jesus healed his soul. But I'm jumping ahead again. See, there's another cluster of people here, and, and we've got to talk about them because maybe some identify with these guys. Check it out. Now, some teachers of the law were also sitting there and thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And the answer is no one. So in a sense, they're right. Because if Jesus wasn't God, he was blaspheming. Because only God can forgive sin. Although you may choose me in a relationship sense because I hurt you, you cannot absolve my guilt before God. Only God alone can do that. And so these teachers were technically correct, but they were also horribly wrong. But because they're surrounded by a mob of Jesus' most vocal Supporters, I want you to note that they didn't say a word. I'm sure they shot a few sarcastic looks back and forth or maybe texted smack. But what they didn't dare do was say anything. But they did think it. And Jesus, having that amazing MRI ability to see right inside their brains, he knew what they were thinking. What did he see? That they didn't care one whit about this guy. They'd stepped over him many times before on their way to church without even a nod. Now they're only here to dig up dirt on Jesus, and they're thrilled because he finally gave them some red meat, and they're going to use that red meat to bring him down. You see, if Jesus had merely prayed and asked God to forgive the man, everything would have been copacetic. Or if he had sent him to the temple to make a sin offering, no problem there either. But Jesus didn't do either one. Instead, seizing upon the full power and authority of his holy name, Jesus spoke forgiveness. And that's when these morons grinned and fought, but they didn't dare say, we got him now. And so Jesus looked him right in the kisser. And with surgical precision, he cut to the heart of the matter, which was a matter of their hearts. He said, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And immediately he got up took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Can anybody still say, wow? Now, since he had been paralyzed, all of his leg muscles were atrophied, right? <clears throat> and so Jesus not only cures his paralysis, he tosses in a little muscle tone as well. <laughs> and so when that man stands, he, he stands without assistance, without a walker, without crutches. He stands. He reaches down, folds that gnarly mat he's been spending his whole life on, and he never looked back. Suddenly, his world has exploded from a little three-by-six pallet to wherever his happy feet want to take him. I wish I could have been there. How about you? But even more than experiencing that story, I want to live the rest of my life in such a way that I'm making stories like that. 
that's the passion that's burning in me as I'm 10 days away. And let me tell you, when God gives me that third bean, I want to join forces with the army of God and I want to wreck more roofs than I ever have before in my life. Anybody with me? Are you with me? I just want to do whatever it takes so that the people in our world that are so paralyzed by guilt and by shame and by fear, I just want to help people get in front of Jesus so they can find healing. But it's going to take more from us, folks, than just sitting in the house. We've got to be willing to wreck the roof, to break with tradition, and to bombard even the gates of hell itself. And you know what? I believe this place can be that kind of place, and I believe God has given us the pastor to lead us down that path. How about you? (laughs) Father God, I thank you for the way you keep pursuing me and loving me, and even now, you're about to heal me That's breathtaking to me, but not nearly as amazing as that day back in April 1966, some 56 years ago, when I first embraced Jesus as the Savior of my soul. I thank you for wrecking heaven itself so that your son Jesus could come to earth for just one little boy like me. And I pray that this church Father, would be just as concerned for the people living around us who are not yet in the house as we are for our own needs. I pray that we would never turn our backs on those who are hurting, but instead that we would do whatever it takes to lead just one more person to the feet of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for your wonder-working power. I thank you for wrecking the roof, the roof of law and of tradition, and then calling us to do even more of the same. Jesus, give us the boldness to do whatever it takes to reach just one more. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I want you to remain bowed before the Lord. I've got some instructions for the next few moments. First, I do want you to remain in a prayerful, meditative spirit. And if you plan on sharing the Lord's Supper today, feel free to go ahead and grab the cup from the chair backs in front of you and just be prepared for that moment. In this story, I ask you to imagine who you most identify with. Maybe you see yourself as one of the four friends. I sure hope so. Do you understand? If if we had a church full of friends like that, we could turn the world upside down by Tuesday at 3 p.m. But let me ask you, I mean, Easter, as Steve said, really is a moment when seekers are most receptive to your invitation. What are you doing about that? Yeah, I only live here part of the year. Who cares? What are you doing about that? Are you truly willing to wreck the roof just so you can get one of your friends before Jesus? I mean, whatever it takes, right? Last week, Many of our people wrote their greatest need on one of these bricks. Well, we got more bricks. And if you've not been wrecking the roof so that more of the people that you know can find hope and forgiveness in our Savior Jesus, maybe what you wrote last week isn't your main problem. Maybe it's urgent, but maybe it's not your most pressing sin. Maybe it's not the most important thing. Or maybe if you're totally honest, you'd have to admit you're part of the crowd. You, you just take in the show and feel content that you've done your nod to God. I want you to hear me. We need you up on the roof. 
I'm calling this whole church on the roof because we are we are running out of time and we all feel it which means so are some of the people you say you deeply love here's my question are they worth wrecking the roof if, if eternity for them is what truly hangs in the balance isn't that worth doing something some of you um, maybe you're the friend on the mat maybe you weren't here last week or maybe you were but you couldn't bear to write that awful word maybe you were nervous about somebody seeing the word that you wrote but you got a need and it's pressing hard on you and the most important need the, the one you really need to get in front of Jesus is your pressing sin I plead with you, do not leave today without tearing some tiles away. And maybe you come up and instead of writing the whole world, you write in code. That's okay, Jesus knows. But to make a transparent confession, I can't tell you how powerful that is. And so the music is going to quietly play for a few minutes. And our pastors are going to be at the cross and up here in the front. They're going to be at the ready. And I hope, I think I have, I hope I've given you enough reasons to not just sit there, but to run, to run to the cross. It is no accident that you're here today. God wanted you here. And you don't have to leave here still clinging to that mangy old man. Jesus is here. He wants to set you free. He died on the cross that you might know forgiveness. Now, if you want to talk, we'll talk. If you want to pray, we'll pray. If you want left alone, we'll do that too. But it's time. It's time to leave your burden at the feet of Jesus. So we're going to linger. And the band is going to play, and we're going to wait just for you. Just understand, the next move, the next move is up to you. And then in a few moments, Eli will lead us in the Lord's Supper. If you need a brick, just come on. Come on. If you need more than one brick, we'll figure that out too. Just come. Please, please, it's way past time we have no guarantee of more time so come come while there is still time